Ladies and gentlemen, the show is about to begin. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nader Naimirad, and I have the honor of being your host today for this week's Beauty Independent in Conversation webinar series. This program is brought to you with the help of three of my incredible colleagues, Miss Jane the General Carlson, Katie Dids Denning, and Ale Gutierrez Spear. A few house rules if this is your first time here joining us. Number one, we will be sharing some content. So if you can, we encourage you to uh, join and enjoy this program using your desktop or tablet computer. Secondly, you are muted, so don't worry about saying stuff in the background or commenting live. It's fine, but if you do want to comment live and you do want the rest of us to hear you, please use the chat function in Zoom. Our panelists, time allowing, will try and respond to your comments if they can. And if you're going to use the chat function, please don't use it for self-promotion. That is a big no-no. And finally, if you would like to enjoy this program again and again, or perhaps share it with friends and colleagues, you're more than welcome to do so because a recording, audio and visual, will be shared with you within 24 hours of its completion. Next, I would like to introduce you to this week's co-host. It is a glass of Glenlivet 12-year-old, double oak. This particular whiskey has been matured in two different types of oak. I don't know what that means, but it results in a smooth, fruity, and complex flavor, and I quite enjoy it. Uh, it is an elevated uh, beverage, and you'll know why as we, as I introduce you to my panelists this week. They are all very elevated. Now, this episode of Beauty Independent in Conversation is brought with the support of Europe Lab. Europe Lab is a full-service contract manufacturer, helping their clients with end-to-end -end solutions, all the way from formulation to manufacturing, even packaging and design. And they are very specialized and their whole heritage is from the professional sector. So if you're interested in going after, for example, the physician or spa market, that is an area that they shine. With over three decades of experience, they have plenty of success stories that they will be happy to share with you. And you can find that information on europelab.ca. They're Canadian, which means they're nice people as well. Uh, so if you're interested, please go there. Now, next, ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to ask you, have you in any time experienced any of these symptoms? You start out as a pioneering beauty entrepreneur with a great idea that you're going to bring to market and you bring that idea, it's gonna go after a wonderful white space. And then you do your research, you wanna build your wholesale business and you identify your dream retailer. Perhaps you even connect with them at a conference or online or somehow you get their email address and you send them your information, hoping at some point to get a call back. And as you know, in most cases, when you send something to a retailer, the response is generally something like this, basically non-existent. So being a professional and civilized person, you wait a week or two, and then you politely follow up with them, and then you politely follow up with them, and then you politely follow up with them to the point that you begin to feel like a bit of a stalker, and nobody likes to feel like that. And then perhaps you're one of the lucky ones, and you get an email back from the retailer, and you are excited, your heart is pounding, you see their name in your inbox and you open the email only to find that there is really no answer there. They need more time. There's been a change in leadership. People have moved around. You're still in limbo. Once this happens to you about a dozen times, you begin to question every decision you've made in your life and you start to think as if you're losing your mind. Well, our diagnosis, you may be doing retail wrong. We would like you to do retail right. A program called Addit that Indie Beauty Media Group has put together helps young brands, especially small independent brands, meet the retailer of their dreams. It all begins with developing your Addit profile. Your Addit profile contains 35 discrete data points that we know retailers really care about. Why? Because members of our retail network, which include over 13 major tier one beauty retailers with more joining every month, have told us exactly what they're looking for. So we can screen your brand against their requirements and see if there is a match. And when there is a match, you will be put in touch with a retailer who actually really wants to hear from you for good reason. And you have the choice to decide if that retailer is right for you. 
If you decide to meet with them, Added will train you, not just how to present to a retailer, but giving you specific information about that retailer and the specific buyer you're going to meet so you are armed to the teeth and ready to make your best impression. Then you get an opportunity to make a live presentation to that retailer, make your case to them directly, and afterwards, whether they like you or not, the one guarantee you have from Added is that you will get closure. You will have feedback within 30 days or less as to whether a retailer wants to move forward with you. And if they do or don't, why? Because in many cases, you can learn a lot from a no, perhaps even more from a no than from a bad yes. If you're a retailer or a brand that's interested in this program, please go to additnow.com and fill out an inquiry form and the Added team will be happy to help you. Finally, I wanted to put a last plug in for Beauty Independent, ladies and gentlemen. We rely on your support. Paid subscribers is what keeps this ship afloat. So if you're not already a paid subscriber, please become one. It's very affordable, only $16.95 a month, or you can become an annual member and save two months on an annual subscription. It very much is appreciated and it really does help support independent journalism. All right. Let's start with our weekly update. This is earning seasons, ladies and gentlemen. So a lot of numbers are coming out, especially from retailers. But before we go into that, we have a segment where we call celebrity brands. We cover which celebrity is entering the market with what brand. Last week, it wasn't so much of a celebrity as a brand. The luxury brand Coach is teaming up with Sephora to start their first ever makeup collection. Now, makeup, of course, has taken a beating during the pandemic, so perhaps they could have picked a different category, but Coach already has a licensing deal with Interperfumes on fragrances, so this was an area that they could work with Sephora. It'll be a limited capsule collection. They're going to dip their toes, see what happens. It'll have seven SKUs anywhere from $16 to $68, and it's going to be sold at both Sephora and Coach worldwide in 22 countries. So let's keep our eye on that space and see what happens. Next, also in makeup, one of the greats just went down. Estee Lauder announced last week. In fact, many of you heard it probably here last week when we had Kirby on the program because the news broke, I think, while we're on the webinar, that Estee is closing this brand down. They bought the brand in 2016 for $230 million from luxury brand partners. The brand itself had been over 10 years old by then, started by an Australian influencer called Rebecca Maurice Williams. The brand really took off in the around 2014-15 with a collaboration they did with the uh, influencer Jacqueline Hill. The Champagne Pop collab was incredibly successful. They sold millions of dollars of product in a matter of hours, and that led to their acquisition. Unfortunately, after the acquisition, things started to go wrong, and last year was very, very cruel to makeup in general and Becca suffered. And of course, there is competition from every corner. You have Fenty, you have um, house from Lady Gaga, so many other people have piled into that category. Plus, it seemed Becca had lost its sway. They weren't able to really innovate and stay top of mind. And the few other celebrity collaborations they did never really worked out as successfully as the one with Miss Hill. Now, this is not the first shutdown for Estee Lauder. It seems Estee has a real hard time with these types of brands. They had to shut down prescriptives a while ago, and they've already taken major impairment charges on Too Faced and Smashbox, which they bought over the last couple of years. All right, moving further into beauty retail, Douglas, Europe's largest beauty retailer, announced that they had a an interesting year. Um, they tried to frame it as a positive um, by showing the massive growth in online, but under the surface, their sales were down almost 10%. Actually, 10% in all fairness is not that bad for a major omnichannel retailer to be only down 10% is actually respectful. What was interesting about Douglas is not only their online sales explode, but their digital platform that they've been building, including their kind of a mini social networking app has also been doing very, very well. And as a result, Douglas is pivoting. They're shutting down 500 doors. They're still gonna have 2,100 doors left. And they're gonna to continue to invest in their online business, which now accounts for almost 40% of their overall sales. Another major uh, retailer, beauty retailer, Sephora, announced that they're going to open 260 more stores. Now, the way they're counting it is a little bit tricky because they had already announced that they're going to open 200 new stores inside of a Kohl's. This is a shop and shop collaboration that they've developed with Kohl's. Kohl's is giving them prime space. They're going to have frontage at every Kohl's. Really, the Kohl's put out the red carpet for them. Uh, and that's going to introduce um, 
uh, Sephora into 29 new markets in places like New Jersey, Ohio, Wisconsin, all major luxury hotspots for vacationers and travelers, but also smaller, less important markets like LA, New York, Chicago, and of course, that great metropolis, Minneapolis, right, right, right there by Target. They're just going to open it right outside of Target just to teach them a lesson. Um, but Sephora is also going to open 60 of their own freestanding stores in the Pacific Northwest, Florida, and Texas and Nashville and Los Angeles. Sephora is basically using this to say that, look, we think brick and mortar and beauty is still relevant. We still think there is growth left and we're gonna double down and invest in that area. Let's see what happens. So you can see Douglas shutting down 500 stores in Europe while Sephora is opening up 260. I'm very curious to see how all this turns out. Now, speaking of partnerships with Kohl's, Kohl's itself reported its fourth quarter on annual earnings. Kohl's is under new leadership. They have a restive shareholder battle going on right now. People want to change the board. I won't bore you with the details, but the bottom line is that they had a rough year. They had 20% year over year sales decrease. But in the fourth quarter, it was only 10%. And they had higher profit year over year than they did in 2019. And this is an interesting thing I want to point out to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that what COVID has done, and you'll see this repeated across many other retailers, is that while their numbers are down, in many cases, their profits are up because they've been able to shut down stores that they've been procrastinating about. They've been able to downsize staff in unproductive stores, just do a lot of stuff that in a normal year they couldn't really do or do at one time. So I think perhaps in the long run, COVID in some way may, may help um, improve retail uh, and the health of those companies. But in the near term, they are still trying to come back to normal. Kohl's is doing their share buyback, doing dividends and reinvesting in their stores. But while Douglas and Sephora and Kohl's and everybody else is trying to figure out what to do and pivoting, there is one company sitting at the top of the hill laughing all the way to the bank and that company is Target. They are on bullseye, ladies and gentlemen. Everything has gone Target's way this year. They have had 21% year over year sales growth. Let me put that in perspective. The total absolute dollar amount in their year over year sales growth is more than their total annual dollar growth over the last 11 years combined. In one year, they grew their business, which was already a multi-billion dollar business, more than they were able to do in the past 11 years. And, and they couldn't help doing this. They just had to rub a little bit of salt in other people's wound. They believe that 9 billion of their additional sales came at the direct expense of their competitors, whether Amazon or Walmart or whomever else, some of the department stores that they compete with. And they had for the third quarter running over a billion dollars in net profit. That's right, 1.4 billion in profit just in the fourth quarter. So. Target is really literally laughing all the way to the bank. They're also doubling down in brick and mortar. They are, they've shown that they had 18% of their orders now come from online, which is double of what was there before. But, and here's the interesting thing, 95% of the orders, including the vast majority of their online orders are still being fulfilled at stores, either at pickup points or drive through points. It shows that Target as a destination is still very, very relevant. And as a loyal Target customer, I can tell you that it is. I, I love, like many people, going to Target or Target, as those of us in the inner circle call it. They're going to invest $4 billion uh, every year to renovate about 200 stores a year. So Target's doubling down on brick and mortar, and this should also be very interesting to see. And of course, in the beauty sector, ladies and gentlemen, if you keep up with the news and look at Beauty Independent, Target's doing some very, very interesting things besides their collaboration with Ulta. They're also at the forefront of bringing smaller indie brands into their stores. And I think this is going to be very exciting to watch. All right, finally, what are we watching? Not that you asked, but I just thought I should tell you. This week, I wanted to highlight The Crown. It's on Netflix. And if it looks like these are a bunch of people who use a little too much Botox and are perhaps constipated, the truth of the matter is after watching The Crown, I believe that the royal family uses a lot of Botox and they're probably very constipated. It's a wonderful program. It is an incredible script. The production quality is superb and the actors are just top notch. I don't know how historically accurate it is. It is loosely based on the British royal family starting in the late 40s and going to the present day, but it is supremely entertaining. And as I said, the script and the dialogue and the acting top notch. So if you haven't got on the crown bandwagon, I strongly recommend that you do so. 
Now, let's talk about this week's guests and what we're going to talk about. We're talking about spa grade skincare. Why, you may ask? Well, coming out of 2020, two things became clear. Number one, that skincare was the fastest growing category, and it is where everybody wants to play. While Estee Lauder is shutting down skin uh, cosmetic brand after cosmetic brand, guess where they spent their money? They just spent $1 billion, $1 billion on buying another 50% of Desia, the company that makes the ordinary, which is predominantly in skincare. So this is a hot topic. The second big area is, and if you've kept up with the likes of Augustina Spader and many other brands, professional quality brands, whether by a doctor or an esthetician, are on a tear because more and more consumers are interested in knowing exactly how this stuff works and how it's going to help them. And so for that reason, we thought it'd be important to sit down and talk to people who actually know how this market works, starting with a good friend of mine and a company that has uh, frequently exhibited in the Beauty Expo. So we've seen them grow with our own two eyes. Alyssa Bayer, founder of Milk and Honey. Alyssa had a more traditional business career. She started out, uh, got her MBA, actually worked at an Austin venture fund where she helped companies find funding and get started. And then she decided that she's kind of bored helping other people and decided to start her own um, spa, Milk and Honey, with a very different approach, a different ethos, a different approach to treating customers and providing treatments. Of course, she had no background as an aesthetician or therapist. It was just an idea she had, but she surrounded herself with the right people. And Milk and Honey has been a runaway success. It now has multiple locations around Texas and now has a booming retail business. Milk and Honey products can be found in major retailers around the country. It is a beautiful, lovely brand that I think anyone would like to have at their home. Our second guest and also our uh, sponsor is Miss Sarah Toshetta. Sarah is calling in from Canada. Uh, now Sarah is with Europe Lab where she spent the last almost 15 years helping companies in a variety of functions over the past five years in Europe Lab. Now, I gotta tell you a little bit about this company because they're actually much bigger than you think. The parent company, Derma & Co., has a manufacturing and a distribution business. In their manufacturing, they have their own professional brand called Nelly de Viste, which they've been selling to um, spas and doctor's offices for years. They now have a mass brand called Druid. And if you would like to use their expertise, which they have a lot, they also have their private label group, which is where Sarah sits. However, she has experience on the left-hand side of the business as well. And to complete the picture, they also distribute a very high-end Swiss physician brand, in Canada and elsewhere. So they also have experience as a distributor. The bottom line is that Sarah has seen it all. Whether you're making your own brand, distributing other people's brands, she knows the professional sector very well and she leverages that experience to help her clients in the private label arena. Finally, she's a bit of a celebrity. If you don't already know her, you should. The one and only Joanna Vargas. Look, there is a line between the University of Chicago, which is known for many things, but not as aesthetics program, to leading one of the cult favorites, which is her eponymous brand, Joanna Vargas. Joanna actually came out of the University of Chicago. She actually created her own uh, major while she was there. She then wanted to go into fashion photography, but realized that that's really not going to work out for her. And she just decided to go into the treatment room. She became trained as a professional aesthetician and over time has built a very, very successful practice with A-list clientele. And I will tell you, my co-founder and a person I have tremendous respect for, Jillian Wright, who also had a very uh, successful spa, spa in New York and still does, very early on told me Joanna Vargas is one of those people who is exactly who she is. Because you find a lot of celebrity aestheticians who are one thing to the outside world and another thing to the people who work in their company. Joanna Vargas is the same person. She treats everybody the same, good or bad, I leave to you. But her brand is absolutely gorgeous. It is the equivalent of a beautiful black cocktail dress, a perfectly cut tuxedo. It is a gorgeous brand that has done incredibly well. It has a cult following from little stores like Shen to major retailers that are interested in her. Uh, she has learned a lot and learned a lot the hard way. So we're delighted to have these three ladies joining us here today. And now we're going to stop sharing and we're going to welcome them. Great. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. All right. Shall we start rocking and rolling? Yes. All right. Joanna, let's begin with you as, as a person who really committed herself to this field as a practitioner. Um, help me understand, paint me a picture of 
what was the world like when you first started working as an esthetician? What did the market look like? What, what, what are the products that you were using look like? What was the world then like? Um, you know, it was very, when I first started, it was very much, everybody was doing the same treatments. I mm -hmm. felt you could kind of get the same facial everywhere you went. It was like, you know, a steam and a glycolic peel and you were kind of done. Um, product wise there, you know, the, the clean beauty industry didn't exist pretty much at all. There was like Jolique and, mm -hmm. um, that was pretty much it at the time. You know, it was just very, um, to me, there was no uniqueness. Um, there were some of the, you know, the OG brands from Europe that were amazing, but there wasn't really to, to my mind, much innovation in the space of of creating treatments or even in the in in the product world so it was sort mm -hmm. of um i felt like i had to fit into the cookie cutter of that you know when i was a younger esthetician and that was one of the reasons why i wanted to start my own because i wanted to kind of break the mold of that Got it. Now, Joanna, most of us will neither have the opportunity the funds or even the the ability to go and get a signature Joanna Vargas treatment. Can you walk us through at a high level, what distinguishes your approach and your um, treatments from what you were first handed back when you first started this in this business? Not comparing yourself to others, but just how have, have you evolved your approach and what you do for your customers over the past few years? Well, I mean, I, I worked in many different places, just to be clear, from, you know, a derms office to a day spa, I tried out very a, a variety of things to kind of find my own voice. But I think what has come from that is just, you know, a focus on science and innovation. A lot of my facials involve technology, um, the combination of different technologies to try to get, you know, uh, the most out of your skincare in an hour session. And then to just really teach my client about, you know, the connection between all of their habits and what their skin is telling them. I think, you know, when I was growing up and when I first became an esthetician, it was very much about what you were born with. You were stuck with whatever skin you, you had or what you were looking at in the mirror. And I think we've evolved enough to know that, you know, diet, exercise, sleep patterns, you know, the way that the that we treat ourselves really has the most to do with what you see in the mirror and not mm -hmm. so much your DNA. So all of those things have really like informed what I do and how I create things. Got it. Now, what prompted you to go out of the treatment room and start your own brand? What was the forcing function that made you say, you know what, I, I got to create my own brand here? Um, I mean, you know, when you're, when you're creating your first salon or your first spa, you want everything to be special for your clients, or at least that was my mindset. And I wasn't really satisfied with what I was, what I was finding. And I had a lot of ideas of, of, you know, what kind of product I wanted to put on someone's face. And that's really what inspired me to create my own. I really felt like I was having some ideas that I, I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. um, my first product that I ever created, my daily serum, which I call the green juice for the skin because it has lots of greens in it, the hyaluronic acid serum. I had never really seen that before. And it was the hardest product uh, to make, to formulate. It took me... Um, two or three years to completely formulate that properly. But to this day, it's my top selling product worldwide. So, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was worth it after Got all it. that. Uh, Joanna, how is your brand, at least in your mind, positioned? Is it meant to be used um, as a substitute for a person who can't get treatments? Is it meant to be complementary, a companion to getting professional treatment. How do you see the line really working? Or is it a bit of both? What's the kind of the purpose of the line? You know, the purpose of the line or the 
the, the way that I frame it is sort of, you know, what are the vitamins and nutrients that your that everybody's skin needs in order to function properly? Um, and, you know, for example, the sheet masks, how can we mix and ma uh, match what our skin's needs are in the moment and just pull from the line something that you really need, like a vitamin C or, you know, soothing with chamomile and hyaluronic mm -hmm. or peptides or what have you. But really, I mean, because I'm a facialist, I'm always going to say that it's a companion to getting co professional treatments. Um, obviously, I believe in professional treatments, um, but I don't want people to feel like that's a barrier. You know, not everybody can can have that. And so what's the next best thing is just giving your facial, I see. facial at home. Great. Joanna, thank you very much. Alyssa, let's move over to you. First of all, how's life in Texas? Well, we are um, mostly back to normal. We have electricity and running water that we don't have to boil and grocery stores that are stocked. So I'm feeling pretty lucky right now. And I heard that your governor, Mr. Abbott, today with great fanfare announced that everything is open and he had to emphasize no more mask wearing. He kind of singled that out as a, a special thing. Um, so seems that things are going back on track. Yeah, we aren't changing anything at our locations. Like we want to take care of our clients and our team and we'll continue requiring masks for everyone and continue um, with our reduced capacity just to keep everyone safe and healthy. Smart. Excellent. Now, Alyssa, unlike, I mean, Joanna wasn't also from this industry, but she kind of went through the training and worked in treatment rooms and kind of eventually uh, towards building her own line. You came at this from a very different angle. Um, you had a more traditional business, you got your MBA, you were working with many different companies. What was the impetus for Milk and Honey? What did you just wake up one morning and you're like, you know what, there's just crap spas around here. I'm just going to build my own. Well, what happened? Uh, you know, it was a variety of, of things that led to this. Uh, when I was in business school, I focused on entrepreneurship and I've always been very entrepreneurial and um, you know, just kind of halfway through, I decided that instead of working in, you know, technology or, you know, I also took a lot of finance classes, I just wanted to, to do something that made people feel good. Um, you know, I was just a little disillusioned from all of the emphasis placed on, you know, corporate pro you know, profits and the bottom line. And um, in my opinion, a business is, you know, successful and profitable when not just the shareholders win, mm -hmm. but the um, community and the employees and the clients and all the constituents that interact with the business like every like in my opinion like everyone can be you know can rise up from that and so that's was really the goal of milk and honey is just to you know sleep well at night knowing that we're you know, making people feel good and providing a great place for people to to work and our you know vendors and community you know that everyone you know ideally benefits from that. Now, look, the likelihood of getting into a milk and honey spa is probably a little higher than getting an appointment with Joanna Vargas, which there is a lottery, by the way. If you want, you can participate in that lottery. One in a million, you may get a facial from her. <laughs> but with, with a milk and honey spa, just quickly paint me a picture. What's different? If I go to a milk and honey spa, uh, spa, milk and honey spa versus you know Jane Doe's day spa in Toledo, Compare and contrast for me and help the audience understand what's different and special specifically about Milk and Honey and why. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure I you know, can answer that. I can speculate. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we really focus on is that, you know, we're not just providing a, you know, a massage or a facial. What we really focus on and, you know, I hope what everyone on our team knows is that our job is really to create a, an experience for people, you know, with the end result being, um, you know, muscles that are less tense and skin that, you know, comes out more healthy with the regimen and, you know, great manicures and pedicures. And, you know, we really focus on the experience. Our culture at the company is, you know, really the kind of where a lot of the magic happens. Like we focus on, you know, all of our employees. If you work, you know, at least 24 hours a week, you're eligible for um, 401k with a generous match, healthcare, paid vacation. So we really try to, um, you know, we're able to attract and retain some really top talent. We spend a lot of time on our architecture, like just the mm -hmm. design of the space is a huge part of our component. And so I don't think there's any, any one thing, right? I feel like we, I see. 
um, try to do a lot of things and you know, still are learning all the time. Alyssa, help us for the members of the audience who are not familiar with spa operations. You guys have what, seven locations now? We're about to open our seventh location in the next day or two in Los Angeles, yeah. Got it, okay. So you're in big cities like Houston and Austin, right? And so, um, and your spas are not little tiny things. They're proper operations with, with a full complement of people and, and treatments. Um, just paint for us big picture. What does a spa operation look like? If you were completely new to this, Mm -hmm. And you had 60 seconds to learn about the spa business. What does the spa business look like? Yeah, well, it is um, much more complicated and not nearly as relaxing as a day at the spa. Like there's so much detail that goes into, you know, every, um, every aspect of it from all the back bar mm -hmm. that we have to hire and the people that are trained and making sure that people are confirmed and they have their appointments. And it is, it's a very, very complicated labor intensive business, but we also, um, you know, attracts like, you know, so many wonderful, great, like healing people. I feel like the people that are in this industry are, are there for a reason because they, you know, want to have that positive impact mm -hmm. on people, but it cool. is um, much more complicated than I ever would have, you know, I, I knew what I was getting into when I started, you know, it wasn't, I didn't think it was a trip to the spa to, to open one or work in one, but it's, it is a complicated business, Nader. It is very complicated. Got it. So listen, from our conversation, and correct me if I'm getting this right, there seems to be these major pillars. One is kind of your real estate operations, finding the space, upfitting the space, because you may have special requirements in terms of water, electricity, drainage, climate control. Um, so there's a whole kind of capital investment component where you got to focus around the space. Then it's around actually getting all the equipment you need and ma maintaining those equipment, whether they're leased, you got maintenance contracts on those things. So whether it's the lasers or all these other things, I'm sure in Joanna's, there's some big thing that looks like an MRI machine. So there's all that equipment that has to be managed and maintained. Then you talk to me about the staffing components. So all the therapists and estheticians that have to be hired, managed, and their utilization is a big driver of your profitability because I assume a big part of your expenses. And then the last part, which you kind of touched on, the last two parts is one, the booking and appointments management, because that's really where you can be losing a lot of money is if, if you're not optimizing your bookings and, and making sure you're making the best use of your space and people. And then finally is the kind of the retail operation where you're selling product to the customer while they're there or on your website. So help me understand, at what point did you decide to do your own brand? Why did you do your own brand? Was it like Joanna, who had an unmet need, who said, I just can't find this stuff? Or was it more that your customers were wanting to continue the milk and honey experience, and they wanted something that just kept them in touch with you? Why did you do this? Or was it just good old capitalism? You're like, hey, there's money to be made here. Uh, no, um, I don't think it, it was that, you know, it took a while. Like we opened our first locations in 2006 and didn't launch our products until, you know, really like January of 2014. And, you know, in the early days when I would go to conferences and would find, you know, looking for products to put on our shelves, um, you know, as Joanna mentioned, you know, it was really hard to find clean products, like the clean part, um, you know, using non-toxic, healthy ingredients in our you know retail as well as our back bar was really challenging and you know thankfully it's not so now I think the bigger challenge is just you know sifting through all of the amazing brands and opportunities out there um, so you know that was the you know I think just at the time wanting to do it it took me a long time to um, you know I think early on we had the idea of doing it and I don't think it was cap it wasn't capitalism although you know certainly extending our brand to you know, home self-care is just a great way of, you know, just building more brand loyalty and recognition. Uh, but after, you know, several years, like six or seven years of doing, you know, just the spa, I kind of wanted to flex some different muscles and do something uh, different that was still kind of under that, you know, umbrella. So I didn't have to, you know, quit my day job. I could just, you know, extend it. And it's been, you know, plus I feel like just having the products, like certainly the margins are better, you know, when we make our own, but it, it took a lot of time and hard work to um, develop the products because we, um, you know, didn't just private label, like we, you know, worked with a, an amazing, um, you know, manufacturer and formulator who helped us, you know, create all of our formulations from, you know, from the ground up, which was really 
time intensive. And what's your hero skew? Uh, you know, we have several, like our intense hydration is one of them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the skincare, but our, our, um, our deodorants, like, you know, we, I just did a clean deodorant. That's right. Yeah, we, we started with just a tiny little, you know, jar of cream deodorant because I have, you know, my mother-in-law had breast cancer and it just was important to me to, you know, create a, another product for your body because we started as Bath and Body Care and Skin Care launched um, just a few years ago. Um, yeah, so our deodorant is our, you know, best-selling item in terms of, uh, you know, quantity. Got it. Yeah. Great. So look, um, it seems what the common thread between you and Joanna is that you both entered the kind of the product side of the business um, for, for your own reasons, but mostly because you saw that there was nothing there that you wanted to use or, or share with your customers. And a key component of executing that vision was finding the right manufacturer, a person, a company that could bring that dream come true. So let's go over to the person who spends her days doing that, helping people like Joanna and Alyssa bring their dreams come true. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Nader. So you help people's dreams come true, basically. Yes, I do. Great. And you also have perfect skin. I mean, I, I don't know what you use or, or whether you're using a filter, but there's not a single blemish there. I'm, I'm just envious, green with envy. I'm getting lines and everything. Skin is dry. I got to change my routine. So um, besides having perfect skin, you spend your time doing all kinds of projects for different founders, people like Joanna, people like Alyssa who have an idea. Um, Help me understand, in your mind, what is different about professional or products that are oriented to the professional audience, whether it's estheticians or physicians, that's different from products that are perhaps more for the mass market, products that are more trend driven, let's say? Well, I think, you know, the professional spa industry really sets the bar high when it comes to uh, their expectations surrounding education and performance based products. They really don't want to compromise, um, you know, efficacy. So they choose efficacy over marketing trends uh, any day of the week. So I think that's a super important element to consider uh, when we look at, you know, spa grade products versus mass options. And like uh, our uh, Alisa and uh, Joanna touched based on they had a, at the time had a hard time, you know, finding uh, these types of uh, high end formulations. And I do see, you know, um, I'm witnessing firsthand the mass market turning towards uh, that are especially in the high end organic space turning towards manufacturers that have this uh, track record in the professional uh, spa grade uh, industry um, to basically offer, you know, safe and result oriented skincare to their consumer base. So it's definitely becoming more prominent. Mm -hmm. So when you say results oriented, help me understand it, it, because that, that could be interpreted in many ways. Is it the ability to um, have formulas that have clinical outcomes associated with them? Is it about being able to source ingredients that could be used in those formulas to drive that kind of efficacy? Like, how do you make results oriented come alive? How's the sausage made in the factory? That's, I guess, what I'm asking. What, what makes it professional? Right? Yeah, it's, it's a combination of what you touched on. It's the fact that uh, most uh, manufacturers that are in the professional uh, space really work with leading universities. Usually, uh, they invest a lot of money in R&D. Uh, they look for uh, a lot of patent types of ingredients uh, in terms of de delivery ability uh, into transforming the skin over time. So I think it's really about a collaborative effort with experts and uh, investment in research to be able to, you know, provide skincare that has an ability to penetrate the skin uh, deeper and not just remain on the surface. Mm -hmm. So when you work with beauty entrepreneurs, so say a, a, a modern day Joanna Vargas comes to you, she's, you know, full of energy, she's cool, of course, and she has an idea. Can you help me give some advice to that person? Because we hear words about using a custom formula versus stock, using custom packaging versus stock. If this is my first foray into building my own brand, from your experience and having seen people succeed or crash and fail, what would be your advice to them? My honest advice, although some, you know, I will be honest, some will uh, try to shy away from in-stock formulas thinking there's a lack of quote unquote uniqueness. 
Um, but, you know, it's important to realize the budget aspect of your project and, 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 and be able to see a scalability in that. And when we talk about in-stock formulations, um, you know, and, and when these, and these clients are properly, um, I should I say, have this, you know, we provide this consultation, they do realize capitalizing on these turnkey solutions that are in stock option can strategically lay the groundwork in building a sustainable skincare business and optimizing their, you know, their ROI, especially when you factor in, you know, the competitive landscape and the level of risk involved in launching a, a new skincare line. So these in stock formulas, you know, have they're high end normally, um, they're backed up by years of R&D. Uh, that they've gone through all the required testings like stability, compatibility, et cetera, you name it. Um, it's a minimal investment when you compare it to custom manufacturing. They're fast to market. There's a quick turnaround aspect. So you could always remain very innovative towards your consumer base because you can launch new products faster. And also the key aspect that I think is super important is the availability of stock ingredients and packaging, especially in light of COVID. Uh, so normally, you know, when manufacturers offer turnkey solutions, they've already stocked, you know, all the ingredients necessary in the packaging. So this is a very important consideration. Got it. Because look, playing kind of devil's advocate, you actually could make more money doing a custom formula, right? You're hourly. So you're like, dude, you want to do it custom? Let's go custom. You know, start the clock. I'm going to bill you. But you're saying, look, a client that's in business and successful is a much better client than one who spends a bunch of money and then went out of business because they just they just ran out of time and money. Um, so reading between the lines, what you're telling me is that the key success factor isn't really so much whether you go custom or whether you go um, uh, stock, it's making sure you make the best use of your limited time and money to get commercial proof of concept. Because something's going to be wrong in your idea. You just don't know what it is, whether it's the packaging, the formula, the, the price, whatever it is. So don't go blow all your cash on some vanity project. Be pragmatic. Get something out. Test it. See how the market re re responds to it. And then if you really need to invest in customizing the things that you now realize need to be tweaked. And if it doesn't need to be tweaked, leave it the hell alone. Don't fix it if it's not broken. Exactly. Got it, okay. Now for a counter argument, let's go to one Jay Vargas sitting in New York. Okay, John, when you first started, you went to a contract company to work with your formulation. Can you walk us through that experience? How did that go? And what lessons did you learn through that process? And what advice would you have for entrepreneurs that are trying to get into the space? Um, well, I mean, first, I, I would just like to put out there that what Sarah said is an entirely true with all things that have to do with business, you have to do what you can afford to do. Um, and, and know what audience you're talking to and do what's best for your clientele. And I think that's what she was saying. Um, when I first started, um, you know, I just didn't know a lot of things that I've done in business, I think I did them without really knowing how hard they were gonna really be. And I, and I just, I'm very much like, yeah, I'll just do that and I'll figure it out as I go along. Um, I interviewed um, chemists and manufacturers as you would for any employee that you're gonna hire because you, know, you have to work with them. And um, I found um, a company that I felt comfortable working with who had a chemist who I'm friends with to this day. Um, and I, you know, he and I have a shorthand. We developed a shorthand very quickly. And it's kind of like, you know, you need to find someone you can communicate with and really tell your idea to. I mean, I think the thing in my favor was that I knew um, I had touched so many products and done so many facials on people. I had listened to feedback for years about what, you know, what people liked and didn't like, what smells they hated, what feeling uh, they didn't Texture. like. Texture. And um, even I, something I never would have thought about, like if your husband doesn't like the smell of the products that you've been told to use at night, women won't use the product. 
So all of these things were kind of in my head when I was, you know, um, first, uh, first starting my first product. And I would just say, like, if you're really going to do it, know that it's going to be the hardest thing. I mean, it really is. It's a big thing. How long did it take you to get it right, John? I mean, start to finish from when you first started the process to when you actually had a product that you were happy with, you know, um, taking all the iterations in mind. We're talking months, years. Be honest. Give us the real, the real deal. The first product took me years. It, years. It, it, because I, I was putting like my whole heart into it. I wanted it to be so good and so special. And I hadn't seen anything that I liked. So it's not like I could have gone to Sephora and been like, here, I just want to make this. Um, there was nothing like what I wanted. So I, you know, it was a lot of getting to understand ingredients very quickly. Like if you can't just put a ton of hyaluronic acid into a product because it'll be very sticky on the face. Mm. So, you know, you want more hydration. What are you going to you can't just be like, put more of that stuff in there. It's not, it's, it's a very exact formula. It's kind of like baking a cake. If you miss, put too much of something in there, it's going to throw the whole thing off. Got it. And so you really have to find, you know, I'm not a chemist, so I needed a chemist to work with. Um, and you really have to find somebody who you can communicate with. And, um, and I found that luckily and, but it still took a really long time. And long time. he hated me a, a few times when I was like, this ain't it, man. And I sent it back to him with, with notes and stuff. So. Got it. Joanna, um, just quick questions. Let's, let's look at your, your formula, your ingredients in your packaging. So do you have custom formulas or did you start with stock and then over time customize? They're all custom. They're all custom. Um, I second. I didn't know any better. I, maybe you got it. Was, if I would have, if I could redo it, maybe I would do it different. I don't know. I, I wanted all custom. So that's what I have. That manufacturer is okay. She owns this fancy spa in New York and wants custom formulas. Let's start the clock. Um, <laughs> second question. Uh, second question. What about your, um, your ingredients? Do you source them yourself and have your manufacturer use them? Or do you have the manufacturer source your ingredients for you? No, I, well, so um, I have three different manufacturers for just different things. And um, that's one of the things that as a, as you know, the formulator, I want, I want them to help me with that. But we, I see. we do um, have a lot to say on, on where things come from. And, and so I see. it's all about it. And then lastly, let's talk about that super sexy packaging of yours. It's, it's really, honestly, I mean, it, it's so special. It's so simple, yet so it just works. Um, how did that come about? How many iterations did you go through? Was it always like this? Can you tell us a little bit behind the scenes, um, you know, about how that came about? You know, that was just um, something that I made particularly a cluster of errors with um just you know a cluster i love that yeah it was it was a cluster of of stuff i i insisted in my first packaging of having everything in glass because you know i wanted everything to feel clean to my clients and i thought they would care about that and while that was a concern that they all had they also had the concern of being able to travel with things that didn't break in their mm. luggage never thought about that um with the stupid glass jars I could never get the labels on without some sort of bubbling like there was never um a good solution for that that was problem number two the branding was not really something that I loved but I kind of went along with the branding because I was like okay I guess so I don't really know and I didn't I failed to take charge in that moment of being like I I hate this you have to start over again um, when I rebranded my products, I went to um, three or four different um, people who do logo and packaging design, and I asked them to present things to me, and each one of them presented between 10 and 15 ideas. My first brander that I, I worked with, I went to this one person, and he gave me the one idea, and I think I, I you know. It was I, the one. 
I whatever. It just wasn't. It didn't work. My package. Oh, it didn't work. Oh. The first guy. No, it was. It stood out in a bad way. I just didn't. I didn't speak up enough for my own brand and what I really wanted. But the packaging that everybody knows and loves today, that's all me participating in the process of hiring, really hiring the right person and finding somebody who really understood what I was looking for, that blend of you know, being completely modern and city, but then having something slightly girly thrown in. Got it. What I love about it is it's cool without trying hard to be cool. It's that's the magic of it. It's like an Apple product. You know, it's cool, but it's very simplistic. Um, now let's go over over to Milk and Honey. So, uh, uh, Alyssa, you when you went down this path of starting your your brand, can you share with us a few of the errors you made or le key lessons learned that that others can benefit from? Hmm. So many things <laughs> that we've learned over the years, um, you know, glass bottles being one of them, like we were all glass with our bath and body line, which launched um, six years before our products and, you know, including things that were in showers. So, you know, learning to um, adapt and think about those things like traveling um, with things as well. I, you know, for us, it was just, I was lucky enough to partner with a, a really great manufacturer and formulator who um, you know, allowed us to do really small runs of things where I could order, you know, 500 or 1,000 units instead of, you know, 10,000, which, you, you know, is not uncommon for opening orders for a new product. And what it's just kind of allowed us to experiment and try mm -hmm. you know, new products. And we've really used our spas as testing ground as well. So, you know, um, involving our estheticians with the whole process. So it's not, you know, driven by me because I'm not, you know, not an esthetician. I've learned a lot over the years about ingredients, but, you know, that's not my um, expertise. So, you know, knowing when to like hand things over to, you know, to the experts and, and listen. And, you know, my job has been more about, you know, taking that information and then kind of helping to, you know, manifest it into mm -hmm. to products. But, you know, we've, we've learned so many things, you know, from, from that process is that, you know, I also think, you know, in hindsight, listening to Sarah, like we would have benefited from, you know, starting with some more of those, uh, you know, already made formulas that could then be tweaked to, you know, put our own DNA on it. Cause it, it did, it took a really long time. Our skincare took six years for us to, wow. develop. and, you know, part of that was, I was still, you know, have, a, you know, a large business to run on the, the spa and service side of things and, and children that distracted me from, you know, pushing this forward faster. But also, you know, there were formulas that took, you know, 87 tries before we got the right one. And it's just, it's a long process. I love, and children, those pesky brats got in the way. I tried to put them up for adoption, but dang it, nobody would take him. So like, fine, I guess I'm stuck doing this. Uh, <laughs> Alyssa, it um, easy, that's for sure. What, what's, what's interesting about your brand, and I just wanted to briefly get your thoughts on this, is and it kind of brings it to, to a head with the fact that the deodorant's one of your heroes, right? I mean, you just don't associate deodorant with a professional great brand. Um, why do you think that is? is it because, and we're going to talk about your retail strategy after the break, but is it that do people really see Milk and Honey as a spa brand or do are there a large number of your customers who don't even know that you guys have a spa network? Yeah, I, I think it all depends on your geography. You know, there's certainly mm -hmm. a halo effect around each of our locations where our brand awareness for our products is much higher, but Yes, there are lots of people who are familiar with our brand um, from our retail partners or our website that haven't that haven't been there. But you know, our to answer your question about the deodorant and you know, like why are we doing a deodorant? And you know, really, it's just all about part of that experience and bringing that kind mm -hmm. of like spa level experience to even mundane things like you know, putting on deodorant. Like it can become you know something that goes from being, if you use, you know, conventional deodorant with aluminum, something that is, you know, potentially like very, you know, harmful or unhealthy with, you know, continued use over time to something that can be, um, you know, like a nice, easy switch to make mm -hmm. in your routine that also, um, you know, like our deodorants, like they kind of smell like the spa too. Like we have lavender and eucalyptus and, you know, I kind of you know, enjoy the 
Man, I've been stuck at home for a year. I so want to go to a milk and honey spa now. You know, if I could, I would just get on a freaking plane right now, go to Austin and go to milk and honey spa. Just the smell of eucalyptus. Now, uh, Sarah, let's go over to you. Um, you know, let's have a moment of truth, okay? Just between us and the few hundred people on the webinar. How much time realistically, let's say somebody's smart and they take your advice and they start with more stock formulas. From start to finish until they get their first skew or two out the door, how much time and money should they realistically budget for? Like, so they're not running out of gas every other week. Like, what's a number to get? What are the table stakes to get in this game as a serious player? Okay, so, you know, between five to $10,000 as an initial investment, mm -hmm. you know, to start uh, to do the whole um, you know, the selection of products, product launch, et cetera. Um, and uh, your second question was, oh yeah, and how, how much time? How, how much time? Oh yeah, within, I would say five to six weeks, you can start com commercializing your brand um, as opposed to, you know, custom, which of course we do. And I'm not trying to, you know, say, no, don't do custom. Um, it's just that it has to be the right fit for your business model. Um, and custom can take, as you saw, you know, years, but usually I would say within a year's time to launch your first product. So um, oftentimes that's why I was suggesting, you know, to lay the groundwork with in stock and then you, you can build and do custom uh, later on and, or, or in parallel, help finance by first commercializing. Got it. Brand. That five grand just seems really, really low. Is that 5K per SKU or 5K for the collection? So you, within a collection, you we recommend between five to eight products, let's just say mm. as a first launch to really have the full routine. Um, but yeah, for the initial order, it's just the, it's not per SKU. It's just five to 10,000 units, depending on the collection you, you, you decide to uh, go with. Now let's go to the other extreme. Let's say I'm a, you know, an amateur cosmetic chemist. My spouse is independently wealthy. He or she owns a hedge fund and said, look, here's some cash. Just, just go do whatever you want to do. So I've got some science background. I have a pile of cash. And what's the other extreme without going crazy? How much money could somebody spend doing a custom line, getting it to market, um, and how much time would that take? What's the other bookend look like? I know it could be infinite, but yeah. realistically speaking. Realistically speaking, on average, if you're just, you know, launching uh, five products, creating five products, it can easily go to over 100K as an, as an investment for custom uh, manufacturing, and the minimums are 1,500 units per SKU. And like I said, it could take up to a year minimum uh, with all, you know, the back and forth and, you know, the testings that are required and all the, you know, aspects of creating your line, it could take a minimum of a year to launch your, your, your line. Got it. And that may be fine if somebody's a physician or a professional and they have a very specific point of view and they really want to work with an ingredient or a formula, then okay, that's your game. That's, that's your point of differentiation. You should invest in that. But if you're more generalized, then what you're saying is there can be almost a 20x difference, a 20 factor difference in costs of getting into market, testing your product between going the fast and efficient route of stock versus the fancy schmancy custom route. Exactly. And a big part of that, you kind of talked about this, but I just want to emphasize it is the testing, right? Because with the stock stuff, you guys have already done all the testing and have it on file. But if you go custom, they got to run all these tests. And some of those tests by their very nature require weeks of waiting and study. Yeah, months, some of them. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Okay, yeah. great. All right, ladies, we're now going to take a short break. You can't go anywhere uh, because through, uh, through trick or, I forgot how the saying goes, hook or crook, crook or hook, we had you share some personal information with us. And for those of you who didn't, we just went to your Facebook page and saw if we could find anything embarrassing in your history. Um, we're gonna play the game, guess the panelist. And we have our three panelists, Alyssa, Sarah, and Joanna, and each one of them kindly shared with us 
often, you know, involuntarily some fun facts about themselves. So here are the fun facts. The first person, while getting married, took a nap. She's not proud of it. It's not something that she wants necessarily repeated to a broad audience, but within this close-knit community of beauty independent in conversation webinaristas, uh, she felt comfortable sharing it. It's a safe space. The second person was, according to herself, the worst waitress. Really, one of the jobs she had was to be a waitress, and she really was not a good waitress. Who, who is if they don't want to be a waitress? But she was particularly critical of her performance in that regard. And the last person um, was, was chased by a very specific type of fish. I originally thought that was code for something, but it's not. She was actually chased by a fish. It is literal. She was, she was chased by a fish. So um, we'll, we'll see who that is. So ladies and gentlemen, please place your guesses. Type them in the chat function if you want to so we can record who said what. As always, there is a secondary Bitcoin backed betting market. If you want to bet on the various answers and make some cash, you're welcome to do so. And here we go. Here are the answers. Ready? One, two, three. Who was the person who took a nap while she was getting married? And the answer is Sarah. Sarah, what was it the night before you were out on your bachelorette party? And as a Canadian, you were partying super hard and then you needed a nap. Well, what happened there? Well, like most brides, I think don't sleep the night before. Uh -huh. um, so I was pretty much up all night, just tossing and turning. And, um, you know, her party was going and uh, the, the dress felt heavier and heavier. And I figured, you know, if I'm going to survive the night, I just need to go take a little uh, quick power nap. So just went in the bridal nap and uh, bridal suite and uh, no one saw. And uh, I, I went ahead and took a little power nap. So I need to picture this. So you were there in the whole regalia, the whole bridal thing? I actually thing. removed my entire dress. Oh, and you, you de-robed? De I de-robed. It was, I didn't realize how heavy it, I don't know. When I first tried it at the store, you know, it didn't seem so heavy, but for some reason we're wearing it an entire day, I realized that it was having some kind of impact on my back. And, uh -huh. and you know what, I need to get out of this for at least a, a good 20 minutes. And I did. And I took a little nap and I felt so completely revived. You don't think there was a deeper psychological thing like taking that off? Do I really want to do this? Is this a commitment I want to make? I need to sleep on it. It was just just genuine fatigue. Genuine fatigue. Genuine fatigue. Great. And yeah. so then you went through with the rest of the ceremony. Everything went well. Everything went well. Yeah. Got it. Last question. Are Canadian bachelorette parties insane? Can you share any detail with us? I'm a, I'm a bit, uh, I have to say, I'm not a party animal by all means. No. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm the life of the party, but a, I'm an early peaker. So I see. I, I, tend see. Be, I tend to be the first woman down for sure. I see. I see. Yeah. Great. All right, let's go to our next guest who according to herself was the worst waitress. And the answer is, and this honestly surprised me, is Miss Vargas, how, how did that happen? First of all, where were you waitressing? What kind of an establishment? What was going on? And why were you not so good? Um, I was a waitress when I was in college in Chicago. I worked at like a, a bar that had like bands and stuff, it was like a music place. And um, I was just the worst. I would, um, I was afraid to carry the tray above my head. So I would always be carrying it like this, which if you have people watching music and dancing leads oh, to yeah. drink on people, which I did quite a bit of. And I also just, I didn't drink that much. So I didn't understand like if someone asked for a particular scotch or some kind of particular liquor I didn't I had never heard of it before so I would have to sound it out to the bartender which was super embarrassing so I was the worst I see I was cute how long were you how, I was cute though I look good doing it uh, how long were you doing this um I worked there for a whole school year uh-huh and uh, were the tips good the tips were amazing I was pleasant enough that I you know despite your poor service <laughs> Yeah. You made good money. Yes, I I didn't I didn't piss off too many people. I do remember pissing off one woman who I spilled a drink on. She didn't think it was as funny as I did, but anyway, 
<laughs> I see. And then um, was there anything from that experience that you've taken to the spa other than don't spill chemicals on people? Um, I mean, I think it, for me, I've always worked very hard to try to overcome whatever challenges I had. You, you don't get born knowing everything about anything that you do. Mm. And I think that, you know, um, I am a very patient te teacher when we hire uh, entry level mm. people, whether it be at the desk or, um, you know, in the, as an esthetician. And I'm, I'm really patient with, you know, correction and training, because I know that that's what people need and lack. And they, they mm -hmm. need someone who really like, um, gives them a break and remembers what it's like to be that green about whatever you do. So I try to be a good mentor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, you now know who has the fish story and it is Alyssa. Alyssa, what did you do to this poor fish? Did you kill its parents or eat its kids or w what happened here? I, well, I was getting my scuba diving certification in Indonesia and was just on one of the, the final dives and was a little bit preoccupied because there was a shark swimming, you know, maybe 30 feet below me. And then I don't know, I think I got too close to, you know, where this parrot fish had its baby fish and um, what felt like an eternity, like it was uh, chasing me and my scuba instructor had a, a knife that he was slashing and uh, these fish have teeth and it was not the most exciting thing, but Look, I don't know my fish, uh, but like how big is this thing? Are we talking like a little goldfish? Are we talking like a this size? Are we talking like, like big? This big, but with teeth. Like it looked uh -huh. like a piranha, you know, underwater, but I survived. Really? Yeah. And they but call both... parrot fish with teeth like that? I mean, as far as I know, most parrots don't have any teeth. They're more beaky. Nope. But for everyone that, you know, suggested that I could have been the worst waitress, um, I also was, I was a waitress for two weeks in college at a restaurant on campus and was horrible, like just absolutely horrible at it. All right. Oh, come on. You got to give us an example. What, what particularly were you bad at? Uh, oh, I was carrying food and they loaded me up with like a plate here and there and I tripped and all, you know, like after these people waited forever for their meal because I forgot to turn it in on time and then I brought their food and you could see the excitement in their face as their plates just went flying <gasps> from the table. So look, but I gotta ask, like Joanna, were you cute doing it though? At least with that was that part okay? <laughs> I perhaps it was it's been a while right. since I've been in college. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I, I was a re residential assistant in college and I got fired. It was the first time I ever got I was a terrible RA. Um, looking back, I should have even been fired earlier. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to go back to our rig. Thank you, ladies, for sharing that great information with us. Um, we're going to go back to our regularly scheduled programming. We're going to change tracks now. So we talked about how these individuals came about uh, developing their product, their experiences, building their product. Now let's talk about selling this stuff. So Joanna made the goop figure it out after years of trial and error, getting the right formula, the right packaging, the right branding. Joanna, talk to us about your retail strategy. What was it like in the beginning and how has it evolved? So what does Joanna Vargas brand now look like in terms of points of sale, et cetera? Now, and and how, did it, how did you get from where you started to where you are today? Um, I, so today we're sold um, you know, worldwide. Meta Porte, Liberty of London, um, Neiman Marcus, you know, a variety of big retailers and then small boutiques. Um, we're in Blue Mercury. Um, lots of lots of different doors that I'm very, very proud of um, to have gotten in there. And I'm more proud. It's one thing to get into those stores and then another thing to actually sell product. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very happy that my, my products are actually selling very well in all of those doors. Um, at the beginning, I wanted to retail. Again, it was an area that I just didn't know that much about. Um, but I, because I was a facialist in New York City, um, I have a lot of connections. So I, I happened to um, have Nikki Kennard as a client who was the founder of Space NK, hence 
the initials MK. Um, and, you know, you can't, I, I'm sure people think that, you know, you can give your elevator pitch while you're giving a facial, but you can't really do that if you want your clients to actually return to you. So um, I, I didn't do that, but I told her I, I was developing product and she was really excited about it. And I gave her some samples and she liked the samples. And, um, but she told me that my packaging was gonna be a problem <laughs> right away, which was devastating. But she, she put me in touch with the store. She was no longer uh, running the stores. So I had to jump through some, some hoops with buyers and such, but I, that was my first retail. Um, door that I had open, I, I opened with all of their major standalone brick and mortar places. So, you know, in all the major hubs in California and, and New York. I see. What, what have you learned over the years in taking your brand, which is very much a, an extension of your philosophy in the treatment room and taking it to retail? Because when you're in the treatment room with a customer, either in the room or in the front, you have an opportunity to explain to them. There, there is already a relationship between you and the, and the person, right? They already trust you. You're in a dark room. You've got your hands all over their face with dangerous chemicals hovering around. So they already trust you. They're already spending a couple hundred dollars getting a facial. And so the next step of recommending a product, they're kind of, and I don't want to oversimplify, they're kind of halfway there. There's still a sale involved, but they're, they're halfway there. How do you transfer that to a retail environment where somebody's walking down an aisle, they're surrounded by all these other brands and um, you want to be noticed and you want to be the brand that they trust. How do you accomplish that? Um, I mean, for us, what's really worked is connecting with the salespeople and the individual mm -hmm. stores. That's really helpful, making sure that they have product in their hands um, to take home, that they have sales incentives. At the beginning, um, we used to run contests with all the, the Space NKs in New York City. Whoever was the top selling salesperson um, for like a quarter, they would win a facial at the salon. So just like, you know, being creative on how you can connect with, those are the people that are gonna be selling your product. and. You want them to know you as a brand um, and for me in particular as a founder. Um, so we used to do cute things like that. Um, and now a days, obviously we can no longer, I mean, you know, that's not really realistic, but mm -hmm. we do do um, incentives, sales incentives with the sales staff in different doors. Um, I make sure that we as a company connect personally with all the buyers and people who and store managers who are in charge of mm -hmm. what's happening in the stores. Um, and let me, uh -huh. let me ask you a question. I mean, look, it's your name on the product, right? Mm -hmm. This is your philosophy. You've picked the ingredients, you've worked the formula. It's very much what's come out of you as Joanna Vargas. How much time did you personally spend with retailers? Did you go out there and train them? Did you do events? How much of your time did you have to invest and you continue to invest to, you know, advocate for your brand and train and teach people? I mean, I would do anything for my brand. So I've done mm -hmm. it all at the beginning. I, I used to do tours of all the stores and I would do in-store events. And, you know, at the time, I'm not sure what it would be like now because that was back then, right? But I was expected to sell out everywhere I went. If a Space NK was hosting me on the floor and I was gonna be in their store the whole day, I was expected to sell out of every single SKU that they had on their shelf. Mm -hmm. And I did, I, see. I did that, but it's an enormous amount of, you know, you have to connect with the client. It's not just like buy this and buy that. You really have to be genuine and connect with the consumers that they're allowing you to have access to um, and do that. These days, I mean, pre-COVID, let's say, um, I only do in-store events every so often um, for a lot of different reasons, but I do do, I have, when we opened Cult Beauty in London, 
I flew to London and I did an in-person training with every single salesperson they had. When we opened Net-a-Porter, net porte rather, um, I did in-person trainings with all of their personal shop shoppers, both in London in person and in New York in person. Um, I see. Right when COVID happened, I was supposed to fly to Singapore to do an in-person train training for net a -Porte for there because, you know, you kind of have to, if you're going to retail, you have to target like who's going to be your top door and, you know, you want to really focus your attention on that and make sure that it, that it's working for you. Two, two, two final questions, Joanna. Number one is you're still working. You still work in the treatment room, correct? I do. I mean, you, you're good. You roll up your sleeves, go in there and, and do whatever you need to do for, I mean, I guess most are at this point celebrities. Um, do you have, at what point, or who was the key hire you had to make to make your retail business work? Was there a key hire? Was there, is there a key role that as a brand founder, you need to be prepared to bring on board to make your retail business fly? Because if you're in the treatment room giving that amazing facial, you can't be also on the phone with a buyer nagging over an invoice or a RTV. No, also I didn't know what to do necessarily. I was mm -hmm. a specialist. I wasn't a salesperson or I, I just didn't know how to go about it. You really need to hire, I mean, there were, they're probably also on the call. So I'm, I'm just gonna say there were two key hires. One was our chief branding officer who had been um, in the skincare and beauty space for a long time, different, doing different things for different brands, um, including Aveda. Um, and she was key because she kind of organized everything for us on what strategies we had to do. Mm -hmm. We had to accomplish in every quarter of her first year being with us. And the second key hire was our, um, our president of sales. Um, she was somebody I knew from the industry. And um, if I could have picked anybody in the universe to fill that role, it would have been her. Um, she happened to approach me uh, and asked me for the position. And I was like, oh my God, right away. Th they were both, uh, mm -hmm. you know, kind of dream hires for us. They were very, it, it was a lot of money for us to invest in personnel. Um, but it was completely worth it. And that's when everything changed for us as a brand, those two women. I see, those two women. Alyssa, what about you? How, how have you kind of staffed and, and supported your retail business? Is it a shared function within your spa operation or did you at some point have a dedicated team? And before you answer that question, if you could kindly answer this question, um, what is your current retail footprint? Where are you sold? How many doors? What's the mix between your own business, spa and deep web versus your wholesale? Yeah, uh, you know, to answer your last question first, it's about a third, um, you know, D to C, um, a third wholesale. And then, you know, we look at our own doors. We treat those like wholesale accounts as well. So mm -hmm. you know, obviously we have, um, you know, lots of, you know, our own locations with trained people um, there. As far as other retailers, you know, our, our D2C business is still um, a big part of that, but we are partnering with really great retailers. We have, um, you know, Neiman Marcus would, I would say was the first retailer um, outside of Whole Foods, which was, uh, you know, we're still in, but they approached us. Like that wasn't part of our kind of active. Um, and, you know, thankfully I met them at our very first IBE because uh, you guys introduced them. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, but yeah, Neiman Marcus, Ulta, we just launched on Anthro online and we're really excited about that. Um, West Elm, we're still, um, you know, kind of figuring that, figuring that out. The, the product side of our business, I mean, the bulk of our business until, you know, this past year, like our our spa business was down, you know, significantly in 2020, as you can imagine. And um, our product, you know, business grew substantially last year. And so we're able to put some more resources behind it. But for many years, I, I joked that it was just my lemonade stand and it was my side business and I wore all the hats and, you know, just you know, borrowed administrative and other help from different parts of the, the business. You know, but now we've got just you know a really great team and a new person who is 
you know, the director of this division of our business. And we're, you know, just mm. a lot of like really great growth and changes happening um, just very recently. Uh, Alison, Joanna, quick question for you guys before I move over to Sarah. Um, Milk and Honey sold on Amazon, correct? You have your own store on Amazon. Yes. Was that a defensive play or was that an offensive play or has it changed? Started defensive, became offensive. How does that work out for you? Yeah, I mean, for us, it was an offensive play, like just to be sure that we um, can control that, you know, that channel and the brand because it's, you know, having the presence allows us to, you know, make sure that other people aren't selling our brand on Amazon. And, you know, I feel like the, you know, we, we really, you know, toyed with that because it's you know hard to, to want to you know be on Amazon and you know does that degrade the the brand and, and I think that there's a lot of really good reasons to be there now and you know part of our strategy is not to put every SKU uh, mm -hmm. on Amazon but have you know enough things that people want to get and you know might need to get in a hurry like deodorant and then have it be a discovery point so they can go to our website and discover more SKUs. More so. Do you sell to other spas? We do. It's not our like as a like a heavy spa user, you know, on the mm. you know, skincare side. I know how much we demand with you know training and on-site training and all sorts of stuff. But it's we uh, we are in other spas and we've got great protocols because we use all of our products, you know, the Bath and Body in our you know body treatments and massage and um, you know in our skincare. But we we do have protocols. For that, but that's not that, that's not our main focus. Like you know, we we've only gone to like I Spa, which is the spa you know conference, um, you know, one time to just to see how it went. But I'd rather, I'd rather so one colors. one day I want to do a webinar from Milk and Honey Spa. I want to be there with the cucumbers and the eucalyptus <laughs> and just chilling like a villain Let's and do my it. webinar there. Well, you'll do it. But in before I go there, I have to go to New York you know, participate in that lottery and see if I can get a patient for Joanna. Joanna, what about you? Are you on Amazon and also do you sell to other spas? Um, we are on Amazon and like Alyssa, it was more of an offensive move to co control that conversation rather than have it be controlled by somebody that wasn't my own company. Um, and there were also already luxury brands. I, I'm a little bit snobbier uh, about things like that. And I wasn't so interested, but um, you know, I could see there were other luxury brands on the site. And um, the truth is, is that a lot of times people just like to cart everything all at once. And so, you know, you kind of have to be willing to change with the times and not mm -hmm. just stuck with a certain viewpoint all the time which I've had to right. learn over the years. And we do right. sell to um, other spas and we also um, were the exclusive skincare for the Grand Hotel in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, we have a few uh, hotel spa spaces and, um, you know, obviously- now, Do you do special SKUs for back bar or does it just primarily for the front retail? Um, we have, um, primarily retail. I do have a couple of special SKUs for back bar that aren't, aren't available for retail sale. Um, I see. So Sarah, let's go over to you. Can you help us understand, like give us the 101, because I talked about special SKUs for back bars, you know, because I know Jillian, Jillian taught me all this stuff, so I don't embarrass myself in front of Joanna and Melissa. Um, but can you help us understand in the professional sector, what is what are the various places you find product and how are they different like what's back bar and what is that and is that a different skew and packaging and stuff and what's the front and I, just can you connect those dots for me please well i think for you know the back bar you want to have some skews that keep your clients coming back for the actual in service in house service so you want to create these like high performance not to say that the retail won't be high performance, but just these kind of formulas that, you know, are safer to use from a professional perspective by a, an, a trained esthetician. And that will create that immediate kind of uh, results when someone steps out of your uh, treatment room. Uh, whereas, you know, the retail aspect of it is like the home care aspect of continuing uh, that at home and, uh, and maintaining the results. 
I see. So, but I just, so you're saying, look, there's the industrial strength stuff that's not for civilian use or not safe for civilian use. So, you know, just trust the professionals with it. So that could be higher concentrations, for example, of, of actives. Um, but what about the packaging? Because I remember back at Jillian Spa, there were all these bottles, like economy size bottles with pumps on them. They didn't even have proper branding on them. It just said hyaluronic acid or, you know, whatever. Um, how does that stuff work? And do you supply those? And as a, if I want to get into the professional business, do I have to invest in those? What percentage? Can you give us any guidance on that stuff? Yes, I mean, anything is possible. And yes, for sure, when you're uh, doing uh, cabin, you know, uh, treatment room uh, treatments, you have to have bigger size just for, you know, the price points and to, to use to do several treatments. So yes, for spas and medical spas, they will require most often back bar sizes, for sure. Mm -hmm. Got it. So if I'm taking my brand to the spa or, or the professional market compared to say, if I'm just selling it at my local target or my local blue mercury, um, I'm going to need product for retail. So both need the same thing. It's got to look right on the shelf. So at milk and honey at the front, before I check out, it's got to look good on the cabinet, etc. And I'm assuming for both markets, you're going to need some testers, but my guess is probably less testers and samples for the professional than you would for say retail where you're trying to get in every bag. Um, but then what you're telling me is that you also need to invest in this back bar stuff, which if you're just a retail brand, you don't need to really worry about because nobody needs that level of concentration or volume. And the last thing you're mentioning is that the other area that you have to make a disproportionate investment is education. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Like, what, what do you mean by education? Does that mean I have to send somebody there to show people how to use the stuff? Is it clinical literature I have to have? What do you mean by education? Well, honestly, uh, you know, we supply them with, you know, they have to learn about like what this formula does, how it, work, uh, how it functions on the skin and how it's supposed to be used too. So, you know, anything with technical sheets in terms of, you know, outlining the active ingredients and really understanding what the properties are and mm -hmm. their synergy that's, that, that, that is created with these ingredients and knowing how to communicate that in a very simplistic way to the consumer. So, yes, we do offer, you know, um, uh, uh, protocols, um, you know, and, and technical sheets to support them in, in this education aspect. Uh, of their services. I see. Joanna, is there a brand in your mind um, that you think, besides yourself, of course, that sets the standard in terms of supporting spa professionals or, or the professional as esthetician market in terms of, you know, they do it right. They, they, they got their act together. A reference brand that people could look at if they want to learn. Um, I think even though they have like so many SKUs, it's, it's crazy. Babor has been a really great um, supplementary spa partner for us. Mm -hmm. um, they have offered um, education to the group. I have um, 25 estheticians in New York City alone. So they've offered, um, you know, group training. They gave us an email and phone number that each esthetician, if she had, he or she had extra questions that they could ask things on their own. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of supportive information on ingredients, practical information on how to use it. Um, you know, when we were switching over to them, they kind of made it very, very simple for us to sort of figure out, okay, we need a peel that does this. Um, and so, you know, it was very easy for us. So Babor uh, was great. Great. Well, ladies, we have come to the end of this journey. I know, like me, you're sad that it's coming to an end. I felt we bonded, we laughed, we cried, we learned a lot about what happens in the treatment room. Uh, but I want to thank our guest, Alyssa Bayer, founder of Milk and Honey, for joining us today and sharing all her great insight from what she's done to build her network and then pivoting over to product and retail. 
Sarah from Canada, who will make your dreams come true, ladies and gentlemen. You have an idea for a brand, you want it to be efficacious, backed by science, and you want to know how to break into the professional market, give Sarah a call. Um, she will provide you with honest advice. And of course, Joanna Vargas, who I didn't know you had 25 estheticians working for you just in New York, who's built by now, we can safely say a bit of an empire of both service and product, beautiful product. Um, and I think her experience also as a pioneer has been very important in really building something that, that others can, can emulate. Join us next week where we have a very, very interesting um, webinar for you. It's about sex and sexual wellness. And just judging by that topic, you know that I will not be the one moderating it. Uh, it will be my colleague, uh, the one and only Claire McCormick, who only does any webinar to do with sex or CBD. That pretty much tells you where her focus is. But we have Rebecca Alvarez story. We have Lindsay and we have Taylor coming in to join us. Um, and I think it's going to be a very, very interesting conversation. This is a booming, booming market. And a lot of people are making a lot of money building this category and leveraging its growth. So very interesting conversation. And finally, I want to thank you, our audience, for joining us, being such a great and interactive audience. I saw so many Q&A and comments back and forth. And we hope to see you again next week. Take care. Bye, everyone.